Well, hello everyone. This is Mike Howard, and I am here with... Beverly Howard. We are going to do a Bible study. We're in the ninth lesson in the book of Jeremiah. We're in chapter 35, and the title of today's lesson is Worthy. Well, when we hear a title called Worthy, we have to take a quicker look at what does that mean? Well, when I think of someone who is worthy, I think of someone who is qualified, deserving of whatever title that they've been given, if they're a doctor or perhaps a lawyer, uh, they are worthy of being called those titles because of their qualifications. They have proven value. And ultimately what I count on, when, especially if it's the pilot of a plane, is that they have met or exceeded a certain standard. In other words, they passed a test. And because of passing the test, they are qualified and therefore worthy of whatever their title is. But let's talk a little more about the word test. A test is a way to examine or to measure someone's knowledge. Now, I know if you're like me, the, I always hated those dreaded pop tests. Uh, and I wasn't awfully excited about just regular tests and especially final exam kinds of tests. Uh, so it tests your knowledge or perhaps lack of it, your skill. And you think here of a driving test where you're you're trying to get your driver's license or a pilot's test when you're trying to get your pilot's license. It's so your knowledge, your skill, or perhaps even your resolve, and that you think of perhaps boot camp or uh, an obstacle course or perhaps an Ironman or a marathon. Those are tests of your resolve. Can you kind of get your way through the difficulty of those situations? Well, testing is not foreign to the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's a theme that runs throughout the Bible, starting with Adam and Eve, where God tests Adam and Eve by telling them that they cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So tests are throughout the Bible, and uh, most of the tests are God testing us, but some of the times we test God. Remember the children of Israel tested God in the desert because they demanded that he give them something to drink some water. And then in, in Malachi, God actually invites us to test him by giving. And he said, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour it in our laps uh, more than we could even take. So testing tends to be a theme throughout the Bible. There's a slight difference between testing that happens in the Old Testament and testing of the New Testament. Uh, and we'll get into some of those differences. By the way, uh, before I leave it, uh, the Bible Project does a really good job with one of their videos called... I love the Bible Project. <laughs> I know, I do too. It's called The Test. So I'm going to list that in the description below so you can click on it and watch that if you choose. So let me give you a couple of examples of God, God in uh, testing his people. The first example is in Genesis 22 where Abraham is tested. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, Isaac. And <laughs> that sounds so much like John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Okay, so, uh, so Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, and there I want you to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And we find out in, in the book of Hebrews that Abraham was thinking to himself, well, I'll go ahead and sacrifice Isaac, but God, I'm sure, is capable of bringing him back from the dead. And that's, of course, exactly what God did with his son, Jesus. There's also a test in Job, Job 23, 10, and 11. But, and this is Job speaking here, but God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. He'll be refined. My feet, had, this is Job saying, my feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. So both of those tests were really tests of faith and obedience. And that's going to be the common theme with God's tests. So let me tell you a little background on today's lesson. We're going to meet an interesting family. Uh, they're a little like uh, the people today that we think of when we think of the the horse and buggy, the Amish people in Pennsylvania, they're a little different in how they live their lives. The name of this family is called Rechabites. They are the Rechabite family. 
and they actually are descending, descended from the Kenites. Now, if you remember, Moses' father-in-law was a Kenite. So these people really weren't coming out of Egypt as part of Israel, but they were finally, they actually became uh, uh, absorbed into Judah uh, later on uh, because they just, they were always on uh, Israel's side and they were always uh, an ally of Israel and and therefore, they were always welcome uh, to be living in the promised land with them. So they really became Jewish uh, later. They, they kind of adopted the Jewish faith. And where is this lesson going to happen? And the answer is it's going to happen in Jerusalem, which is a little bit unusual. And you're about to find out why. And then when does it happen? It happens after the first wave of exiles to Babylon. Remember, it happened in three waves. Daniel goes in the first wave. And then uh, Ezekiel goes in the second wave, and then most everybody else, because the city and the temple are destroyed, go in the third wave. So this is between the first and the second wave. But Nebuchadnezzar has laid siege to the city. So what happens here? And the answer is God is going to test the Rechabites, and they're go he's going to use what happens in the test as an example to all of the people living in Judah, mostly in Jerusalem. It's a really interesting story. I can remember it vaguely from uh, years and years ago, but this was great to get refreshed in my memory. So chapter 35, 5 through 19. We're, uh, now, verses 1 through 4, let me structure what's about to happen here. God tells Jeremiah to invite the Rechabite family over to the temple to have a drink. Now, that seems like an unusual thing for God to ask somebody to come. Okay, come on over and have a drink. So verse 5 is the beginning of our focal passage here. So Jeremiah sets bowls full of wine and some cups to drink from before the Rechabites. And he said to them, let's have a drink. I'll toast you. Okay, so he's, he's offering them some wine. But look what the Rechabite family says in response. Mm -hmm. But they replied, I'm sorry, but we don't drink wine because our... Fo and he tells them why he doesn't drink, they don't drink. Uh, we... Don't drink wine because our forefather, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, and that, that's where they get the, uh, the name Rechabites, son of Rechab, uh, gave us this command. So follow this command. It's a pretty interesting command. Uh, we were commanded, okay, so you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. Well, okay, so it's kind of like John the Baptist. You're going to be ascetic, ascetic. But then he goes on to say they were given several other commands. Also, uh, Jehonadab says, you must never build houses. You must never plant crops and you can't plant vineyards. Well, I guess that's kind of being kind well, because if, well, if they planted the vineyards, then they would be tempted to drink the wine from the grapes, I guess, if they planted the vineyards. So you can't build houses, you can't sow seed, you can't plant vineyards. You're basically, you're going to live a life of a nomad with your sheep, your goats, and your cows. You must never have any of these things, but you must always live in tents. So it's, very, it's, it's a life very similar to the life that Abraham yeah. was instructed to live when he first came into the promised land. So they were instructed by their great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather to not drink wine, nor to build houses, or to plant crops or vineyards. But there is a promise with this command. So uh, the, they were told this in verse 7. Then if you do these things, if you keep these commands, you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. Okay. Interesting. So it's a command that has a promise. Very similar to uh, obey your father and mother, honor your father and mother, which is the first command with the, with the promise. So Summary. Now, this is where, so, so Jer Jeremiah's kind of getting a, a historical lecture on, on why they don't drink wine. So then the head of the, the family the, uh, says this. He says, okay, so as a result, we have obeyed everything that our forefather, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, commanded us to do. So throughout the centuries, we kept his commandments. Uh, we, neither we, nor our wives, nor our sons, nor our daughters have ever had any wine to drink, nor have we built houses to live in or had vineyards or fields or crops. We were commanded to live in tents. 
we have lived in tents and we have fully, catch this, and now you're about to get a clue as to why God told Jeremiah to do this because we have fully obeyed, because you know the nation Judah has not obeyed, okay? So we have fully obeyed everything that our forefather, Jehonadab, commanded us. So, but, and so then the next question it begs is, okay, so if you are living in tents and if you are nomadic, why are you here in Jerusalem so that we can invite you into the temple? And so he goes ahead and explains that. He says, but when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded this land, we said to ourselves, okay, so now you can understand that Nebuchadnezzar has gone throughout the countryside killing and, and, uh, and exiling people. And so they wanted uh, to be safe from that. So this. So they said, uh, come, we must go to Jerusalem. So we're in a walled city to escape Babylon, the Babylonian and the Aramean armies. So we are here in Jerusalem uh, until this blows over, until it ends. So God is now going to take this wonderful family and their conviction and obedience to these commands, and he's going to use that story for a lesson to the nation of Judah. So then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, go, Jeremiah, and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, look at this example. Look at this story. Will you not learn a lesson from the Rechabites and obey my words, declares the Lord? 245 years ago, there forefather from seven generations back gave them can you imagine do you know if you go back 245 years from now it was 1776 that's when the united states of america was basically declared independence from england that's i mean that seems like ancient history to me well guess what that's how far and how long ago it was when they received that family received this command to not drink wine so it says here, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine. And this commandment, the family has kept for this many years. And this to this day, they do not drink wine. Why? Because they obey their forefather's command. But, and this is where he says, <laughs> he's, this is where he's going to contrast these Rechabites who have obeyed their seven times great-grandfather to not drink wine to Judah who can't seem to follow God's direction. He says, but I have spoken to you. And I want you to watch this because in, in these two verses, he's going to repeat himself. Anytime in the Old Testament, they didn't have bold and underlining and asterisks and, and uh, highlights and any way to kind of uh, make things stand out. So what they did, uh, the, the authors would simply repeat the idea uh, multiple times. And if they wanted to make sure that you understood that this is what God was doing, they would repeat it at least twice. So in verse 14, but this is God speaking, I have spoken to you, Judah, again and again. So that's twice he says it. Yet you have not obeyed me. And then in verse 15, again and again, I sent all my servants the prophets to you, and they told you, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. You must repent. Do not stop doing this. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Stop with the idolatry. And that's what again and again, from morning to night, I've been telling you over and over and over and over and over again, stop with the idolatry. And there's a promise if you do that. If you do, just like the Rechabite promise of if you'll not drink wine, you'll live long in this land. He says, I've got the same promise. If you will stop the adultery, then you will live in the land I have given to you and your ancestors. But guess what? Unlike the Rechabites, you have not paid attention or listened to me. So you got the Rechabites with this ancient grandfather, great, great grandfather, uh, that they pay attention to. And then you've got the, the, the people in Judah with the almighty God of the universe, their creator, that they won't listen to. So a summary. This, so, so Jeremiah summarizes. He says, the descendants of Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, have carried out the command that their forefather gave them. But these people 
the people of Judah have not obeyed me. Therefore, and this is where God issues his verdict. Therefore, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, versus the great, great grandfather says, listen, I am going to bring on Judah and on everyone living in Jerusalem, every disaster that I pronounced against them. So when I do this, you will understand it is because unlike the Rechabites, who have obeyed their ancestor, you have not obeyed your God, your covenant God, your creator. Judah refu refuses still to hear and obey. And next week's lesson, it's going to become even more clear. As a matter of fact, next week's lesson is, is not uh, a pretty story. I spoke to them, now this is God talking, but they did not listen. Remember what I said about uh, repeating things. I, I called to them, but they did not answer. So that's the end of that part of the story, but it's not the end of this lesson because then Jer God tells Jeremiah to turn to the Rechabite family and give them uh, a message. So listen to this. God speaks to the Rechabites. Then Jeremiah said to the family of Rechabites, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to you. You have obeyed the command of your forefather, Jehonadab, and you followed all of his instructions and you've done everything that he ordered. Therefore... I am going to reward your faithful obedience to him. This is what the Lord God Almighty, the, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will never fail to have a descendant to serve me. What a great promise. You get a feeling here, of course you get several feelings here, that you know God is, is really holding up this family as this wonderful example of obedience and therefore the reward that comes from that obedience. Even though it was an unusual command, really kind of weird to speak of, that the, the Jehonadab asked them to do, and yet even though it was weird, God uh, honored them because they kept the command. They obeyed, okay, and they kept the commandment of their forefather. And he contrasts that, contrasts it to uh, Israel who just can't seem to get their act together to obey their creator God Almighty. All right, so he says that. But then he makes it really clear, I really value obedience. I value a heart that follows me wholeheartedly. And because of that, I will reward obedience. And that's a beautiful thing. And we're going to get to see that a little bit more soon. So let me summarize the lesson. God uses an unusual family to portray worthy obedience. You have to, you have to admit, if you're looking at trying to find an example of obedience, this is a great family to look at. I mean, they have done a magnificent job. And then he contrasts their obedience to their, distant, uh, to their distant grandfather, to Judah's refusal to obey their almighty God covenant partner. That's a pretty good contrast. So then God points out this, and it is the reward for obedience versus the punishment for disobedience. God will reward the Rechabites forever for their obedience, but then God issues a verdict where he will punish Judah by exiling them for their refusal to listen and to obey. Now, that's a great lesson for the nation Judah, but how do we apply that lesson today as Christians? Because we know that there is no punishment for us. Jesus took our punishment upon himself on the cross. So, we understand the testing for obedience in the Old Testament, but what does God's testing look like for those of us who are Christians in the New Testament? We still are tested, but there is a difference, a slight difference in not only the reason for the test, but also the rewards for the test. So obeying for Christians, obedience through faith is absolutely crucial for us, for our joy, and for our sanctification. And let me explain that. If we are going to be joyful in our relationship with the Lord, we must walk in obedience. Now remember, Paul was trying to go one direction and God wanted him to go the other direction. And God said, Paul, you got to quit kicking against the goats. It's only going to be painful for you. So if we as Christians want to live a joyful life, we've got to get in sync with the will of God. We've got to obey his instruction. When the spirit says go left, we got to learn to go left. After all, we are yoked 
Shared with joke. shared yoke with our Savior. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, if you've ever seen two animals in a yoke, but if one animal decides to go one way and the other one decides to go the other way, it's not a pretty sight. Mm -hmm. So we need as Christians to know that if we're going to be joyful with our salvation, it's going to be because we're tuned in and we're obedient to the guidance of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And our sanctification, uh, our obedience has really, I mean, a, a really solid reason. It is to s separate us from uh, not only our flesh, the, the fleshly desires, but also from the culture of the, the world. And so that separating is sometimes painful. And in order for us to separate, we're going to have to be obedient. And mm -hmm. obedience then is going to require a test. And that testing is sometimes going to be quite painful. Mm -hmm. So we have a new heart. Now, the good news is this, as Christians, we, he is, God has given us a new heart and a new spirit inside of us so that we actually have a desire. Unlike the, the Israelites who didn't really have a desire to obey God's word, we as Christians have within us, within our spirits, within our, our new hearts, we actually have a want to. We've got a want to, to obey the, the commands of the Lord. And then we have to also understand this. We are going to be tested as Christians. We saw all the tests of Abraham and Job. And by the way, you remember Jesus was tested right after his baptism. He went into the wilderness and he was tested uh, by Satan. Okay, so we're going to get tested. If Jesus got tested, we're going to get tested. So uh, God is going to test us so that we can be two things here. One is purified. Uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, the dross being taken away from the silver and gold being purified. Well, our faith is being purified as well through these tests. And the other thing the Bible says tells us is that through this testing, you remember the, the, the Iron Man example and the marathon example and the, the, uh, the, 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 where you, the all that other, the, the things that require really exertion. Well, when we're tested by the Lord, it's going to help improve our endurance. And endurance is a big deal. All right, so how should we view testing? We should view, when God tests us, we should view our trials and our difficulties as opportunities. The Lord's working on us. He's turning us into the image of Christ. And they remember this when we're tested. These tests are from a loving God who is like a, like a parent, like a good parent. He's disciplining us to mold us. Remember the story of the potter and the clay. He's molding us into the image of Christ. And you can find that in verse, uh, or chapter 12, verse 7 of Hebrews. It's, it's a uh, great verse. But let me finish up here with several scripture verses, because I think they're appropriate. Uh, in James chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person, oh, catch this for a reward, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to all those who love him, to all those who are obedient to him. He's promised us this crown of life. So just like the Rechabites were promised a reward and God promised Judah a reward if they would simply repent, we as Christians, when we endure our tests that are gonna come, then we're promised a reward as well. But catch this in Romans chapter five, verses three through four. We also glory, Paul says, mm -hmm. in our sufferings because we know that is our suffering is going to, these are tests, they're going to produce perseverance. And then that perseverance is going to produce in us character, the character of Christ. And that character is then going to produce that hope that we have for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. John 14, 23, and Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will what? obey my teaching. My father then will reward, will love them and will come to them. And then we will make our home mm -hmm. with them. I, like I love that. Mm -hmm. And we will make, we will, we will come to them and we will make our home with them. So obedience is a big deal. It's a big deal in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal in the New Testament. Yes. Where our obedience in the New Testament comes through faith and it comes with a new heart and a new spirit within us. But I'll just let you know that our flesh can lead us the other way 
and the culture can lead us the other way. And because of that, God gives us tests. And that is why we sing this wonderful song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, see, this is great. What a glory, remember the joy, what a glory he sheds on our lives, on our way. While we do his good will, obey, he abides with us still. Remember, we will come to live with you, okay? And with all, all of us who simply trust and obey. So there you have it. You want to be worthy? Obey. You want to be worthy? You're going to be tested. And that is the life of the Christian. As we go through this world that is fallen and torn apart, we will find ourselves tested to take us out of the culture, to take us out of our flesh, and to make us perfect before God. And that will give us the insurance that we need. All right, the mind of Christ. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for this wonderful story of these Rechabite, this Rechabite family. I, I can vaguely remember having read it before, but it was great to be refreshed with this super interesting family that, that is still 250 years after they were commanded, still obeying these very interesting and difficult commands that they were given to live a more of an ascetic life, kind of a, away from the culture. And uh, Father, they were, uh, they were sojourners, much like Abraham, I mean, much like us today, we are also sojourning in this kingdom because we are foreigners and we know that we are ambassadors while we're here. So Father, thank you for a wonderful story. But also, Father, thank you for reminding us the importance of obedience and the importance of obedience through testing. And that, Father, you will, because you're a loving God, you will test our faith. You will test us. And in that testing, we have the opportunity to grow and to become more like Jesus. So thank you for this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Another good lesson in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, See you next week when we're going to see an interesting act by one of the last kings of Judah. And it pretty much puts the seal on their future fate. So we'll see you next week. Until then, stay healthy and know that we love you. Take care. Bye-bye.